You know, it's already been a great time to worship this morning, hasn't it? And we're just going to go ahead and launch right on into the sermon. And uh, a little, little change of pace for you, I guess. But God is indescribable, isn't He? You know, we, uh, when we're baptized into Christ and when we first come to know God, we're, the, the Bible tells us we have a relationship with God. But He is, in a sense, the unseen God. We've seen Jesus in the Bible and we've seen God working in our life, but we, we set out to have a, a relationship with God. And sometimes uh, I think we're a little bit like the person who lived in Flatland. And maybe you've heard of Flatland before. Flatland is like a, a two-dimensional world that only has height, sort of width and length, but no height. And so imagine for a second you're living in Flatland and and a ball, a big ball, rolls through flatland. And you say to yourself, wow, look at that circle that just kind of came rolling by my life right there. I wonder what that was. And in a little bit, that's kind of what, what we're like in relating to God. It's hard at times to exactly understand the greatness of God. If we could only understand how much God loves each one of us. You know, the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians chapter 3 that he prayed that, that you would know the height and the width and the depth of the love of Christ. And he, and he was hoping so much for people to understand that. But over the uh, next few weeks, we're going to be discussing what God is. Yeah. That God is, God is truth, God is sovereign, but God is today indescribable. Maybe as you looked at that video you got a sense that how do we quantify, how do we measure, how do we describe a God who could create some of the things that you saw in that video? What do we do? How, how do you describe it? How do, how do you, in your own heart, connect with that? And that's what we'll be looking at in the uh, weeks to come. You know, David said this. And imagine David, you know, here he is out tending his sheep. And it's, it's, if you, when you get out in the country, you know how there's no lights at all? Maybe maybe some of you go camping or something or live way out in the rural places. You, you get out there and there's no lights. And so you look up and you see this amazing star system. And David penned these words. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of His hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they display knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. David looked up in the skies and he said, look at the glory of God. You know, that uh, constellation you're looking at right there is Pleiades. I think I uh, pronounced that right. And uh, when Job was struggling in his relationship with God, God told him in chapter 38 when he kind of rebuked him and, taught, and ex- explained to him why all the hard things had happened to him. He made this statement to him. Can you bind the beautiful Pleiades? Can you loose the cords of Orion? You know, he said, can you, Job, can you reach out and take hold of all of those stars and bind them together and make them look like that? Can you take the cords of Orion and stretch them out across the sky? Job, can you do that? And of course, Job said, no, no, I really can't. And he said, yes, every day my glory shines out to this world. The Apostle Paul said this in Romans chapter 1, for since the creation of the world... God's invisible qualities, His eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. Paul knew that God had put on display His eternal power. That if people would take the time to really look, they would see this unbelievable power of God. You know, this is the scene perhaps that David saw. Yet, what would have happened if David had had the, the tools that we have to look into space? David saw these, these stars and he said, look at the glory of God. You know, with technology, we can see this a whole lot better. And I want to show you the next slide. You know, what you're looking at there is imagine you're looking at the night sky and you sort of put your finger up about the size of a dime. That's about the amount of space that they're focusing on right now. The Hubble the telescope, it sits 323 miles up into space. And what it does is it'll kind of take a series of pictures, kind of... 
trying to uh, quantify the universe. What you're looking at that, that right there is about the size maybe of a dime or so up in the sky. And you are seeing not just one galaxy. Look at all of the galaxies that you see there. Now, now imagine looking all over the sky. All you saw is a little tiny bit like a dime size. But then look all around and everywhere you can see if you can really truly see what's up there. You're seeing all of those galaxies. God said this, to whom will you compare me? Who's my equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? He who brings out the starry host one by one and calls them each by name because of his great power and mighty strength. Not one of them is missing. He says, I can start. And I can call these stars one by one and call them out into the night skies so that not even one of them is missing. There is no way for us even to quantify the amount of stars that are in the heavens. In our galaxy alone, and all of those things you see in there are galaxies, but just in ours alone, there's billions and billions of stars. Yet God, how great He is and how great is the Lord! How can we describe this? How can we say what He really is? He can say, I can call them out one by one and not a single one is missing. You know, if God can do that with the stars, what can He do with you and I, your life and my life? Do you think that His eyes are on each one of us? If He can call the stars one at a time, does He have His eyes on His people? Does He know their needs? Is He with them? Is He concerned? Does He have a plan for their life? Even when the hard things, and I appreciated what Angela had to share. How God, she had hard things in her life, but God was there. God was working. You know, uh, this is our little niche in the universe. This is the Milky Way galaxy. That little dot you see at the bottom down there, that's where, where our solar system is. Now, our solar system is so teeny tiny that you couldn't even put a dot on there which would, would be representative of what our solar system would even look like. Literally, this is billions and billions of stars. You know, in order to measure something like this, we need to talk in terms of the speed of light. The light moves, God, you know, in Genesis chapter 1, 1, the Bible said in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. Now imagine just for a second, God and His unbelievable greatness saw everything was dark. And he said, I'm going to make light. And he just, out of his mouth, boom, came light. Recently, we had uh, Dr. John Oakes, who's a professor of physics at uh, Grossmont College in, out in California, San Diego, come and, and speak to the campus and then some of us who are taking an apologetics class, a great class with Glenn, Glenn Giles. And he began to talk about the Big Bang Theory. And how science has pretty much proven that there was a Big Bang at some point. You know, they've got a variety of instruments to prove that, but that's true. There was a big bang. And John said, yes, there was a big bang. It was when God said, let there be light. And bang! There it all started. Let there be light. Pow! The greatness of our God made that happen. You know, the speed of light that God created travels at 186,000 miles a second. In, in one second, it, go, it can go all the way, on the way around the earth eight times. In a single second, it's just around the earth. You know, in one year, light can travel 5.88 trillion miles. So imagine here you are on earth and you've been fitted with some unbelievable spaceship, kind of like Star Trek, and you and Scotty and everybody get on board and you say, Warp speed, Scotty! And off you go into the universe. And you say, we are going to go all the way across just our galaxy. Not all those other galaxies you saw a second ago. But just our galaxy. And you take off and in one year. You look around and you say, congratulations. We have gone 5.88 trillion miles. One year. How many more years do we have to go? And you know what the answer would be? To get just across our galaxy. 99 99,000 more years just to travel across our galaxy. 
And that's not even counting all the other ones you just saw in the picture. There are literally billions of galaxies. How great is our God. When David said, the heavens declare the glory of God, was he not telling the truth? How big is our God? What is our God? God truly is indescribable. We can't describe it. What does it mean when God says, you know, that my love is, is greater for you than it, from earth to, out to the heavens? What does God mean by that? Uh, how do we quantify that? How do you get your mind around what God really is? Here's our little home in the Milky Way galaxy. But then, God said, let there be light. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. This is our little portion of the light's our world, isn't it? It's the sun. It's 93 million miles away from us. It's a, a, about a million times bigger than the earth, so that you can stick about a million earths inside of it. That's how big it is. On the surface of the sun, uh, it's 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. At the middle of the core of the sun, it's 26 million degrees. Think how hot it is. Maybe this picture will give you an idea. That's a close-up of the sun. It only takes eight minutes for that light that's generated there to get here to the earth. It's a raging ball of fire. God, out of his mouth, the Lord said, let there be light. Psalms 33, 6 says, by the word of the Lord, where the heavens made their starry host by the breath of his mouth. What did it mean when God said, let there be light? And there was light. Here we are. Our little world, right? It's kind of interesting to see the world from this perspective, isn't it? Maybe you can see through the clouds there. That's the continent of Africa. And, and that's uh, uh, the Middle East there at the top of the uh, screen. And there's our little world that we live in. And, you know, when you look at it from this vantage point, it doesn't look quite so formidable, does it? You can't see any of the problems, the traffic jams, the unpaid bills, the challenges, the, the petty squabbles. It just doesn't quite seem so great, does it? You know, Neil Armstrong, as he was coming home on Apollo 11, he made this statement. He said, I remember on the way home on Apollo 11, it suddenly struck me that tiny pea, pretty and blue, was the earth. I put my thumb up and shut one eye, and my thumb blotted out planet Earth. But I didn't feel like a giant. I felt very, very small. God looks down at the world. He looks at His creation. He's created this for His people, for those that He loves. And yet, from His vantage point, the Earth isn't quite so big. You know, you and I, we get pulled into the kingdom of this world. And we think it's, it's kind of incredible. That, that, that this world, this, king, this kingdom of the world that we're in is so impressive and so overwhelming. But if you step away from the earth and you think in terms of, no, I've been called to be in the kingdom of heaven. See, when you get away from the earth and everything obeys God, once you step away from this little ball right here, everything does exactly as God would have it to do. And that's what it means to be in the kingdom of heaven. It's those people. It's those things that obey the Lord. It's where Jesus, Lord, it's where God rules. That's His kingdom. And He says, come, repent, be in the kingdom of heaven. It's a little different. You know, uh, a few years ago, 1977, uh, NASA launched Voyager. And it was a spaceship that was designed to go and take pictures out in space. And so it took off in 1977. And then in about 1990, it had traveled 3.7 billion miles from the Earth. And so before Voyager had taken pictures of all the planets along the way, and you can go online and you can look at the pictures of Voyager, took of various planets, it's super cool. But just before Voyager was going to sort of zoom out of range, they told said, Voyager, turn around and take a picture of the Earth, 3.7 billion miles away. And so the Voyager spacecraft turned around and started taking a series of pictures, sort of like that, you know, a bunch of pictures right in a row capturing what space looked like. And try to think for a second, what did Voyager see from 3.7 billion miles when it turned around to look at Earth? And there it is. 
That little teeny speck you see is earth in the vast darkness of space. There it is. That, that light that you see is a reflection of, the sun, of sunlight. It just happened to catch the earth in a ray of sunlight right there so that it could report back to us that little teeny mark. That's the earth. How great are you and I and how great is the Lord? How can we describe the indescribable, the amazing nature of God? You know, when Carl Sagan, the, the noted astronomer, first saw this picture, this picture created quite a stir among astronomers. In fact, go on the Hubble uh, telescope website. It's super cool. They'll show this picture of all the scientists gathering around with the new pictures that are coming in. And they're like little kids about to open a Christmas present. They're like, whoa! It's like, that's so amazing! Look at that! And that's kind of the way they do it when all these images filter back from the Hubble uh, telescope. And that's what they were like when Voyager sent this picture back. Now, each one of these pictures were 640 pixels. It took five and a half hours for every pixel to get back to the Earth. So imagine it took months and months for them to get this picture. But a little at a time, they sent this back. And Carl Sagan, the noted astronomer, when he saw this picture, he made this statement. The Earth is a very small stage in a vast cosmic arena. Think of the rivers of blood spilled by all those generals and emperors so that in glory and triumph, they could become the momentary masters of a fraction of a dot. Think of the endless cruelties visited by the inhabitants of one corner of this pixel on the scarcely distinguishable inhabitants of some other corner. How frequent their misunderstandings. How eager they are to kill one another. How fervent their hatreds. Our posturings. Our imagined self-importance. The delusion that we have some privileged position in the universe are challenged by this point of pale light. Our planet is a lonely speck in the great enveloping cosmic dark. You know, Carl Sagan doesn't believe in God. If you can look at that picture and say to yourself, what are we? Who are we? If you don't come at that from the perspective of God, then you make the statement, our planet is a lonely speck in the great enveloping cosmic dark. If there is no plan, if there is no divine guidance, if there isn't something greater that's, that's able to do all of this, and I want you to think for a second, the, the, the one who created this loves you will listen to your prayers, died for you, is eager to be in a relationship with you. You can understand that this, this great God in the months to come. You know, I wanted to look at this picture as well. And, and we're sort of, imagine now, we're, we're sort of taking this journey that perhaps David would have liked to have taken. And the Hubble telescope is allowing us to look further and further into space. We saw all those galaxies, and what we see right here is kind of an interesting thing, isn't it? It's called the Hourglass Nebula. This is 8,000 light years from Earth. It, what it is, it's a, it's a, a dying star, and that's the, what they think is, is there's, a bunch of, there's a, a lot of wind that blows all the gases kind of around this, uh, this dying star, and that, that picture in the middle there is the dying star. Now, what does that look like right there in the middle? Kind of looks like an eye, doesn't it? In fact, this has become quite a famous picture. When they first got this uh, picture back, you know what scientists said? Wow, maybe God is watching. <laughs> remember, that, remember that Church of Christ song, that old one that says, you know, there's an all-seeing eye watching you? You know, maybe you guys remember that singing that. Some of you really, truly old-timers like myself you can go way back to that song. But we used to sing the song, there's an all-seeing eye watching you. Well, I guess it's true. Maybe God does these things just as a laugh. Hey, let me, let me send this picture back. We'll swirl with dust here with my finger. Now look at that. Looks just like an eye. I really am here. I really can see you. I really can see your problems. I can hear your prayers. I know where you're going. I know what your life is all about. I'm the Lord. I care for you. You know, a uh, pretty incredible thing. And so imagine we've been flying our spaceship for now 8,000 light years, and we'll just kind of keep on going. 
And we'll go way past the Milky Way galaxy. We'll go 28 million light years. Now try and think about that for a second. 28 million times 5.88 trillion. What is that? What is that number? Can you, can you wrap your brain around that? 5.88 trill, mil, trillion times 28 million. And what's out there? What's waiting out there? That's it right there. It's the Sombrero Galaxy. Now that is an awesome looking side, isn't it? Is that not cool? You know, it's sitting at a sort of a direct angle from the Hubble telescope, so it gives that picture. Now again, imagine, you know, the first time a scientist saw this, they were floored by this. This galaxy is 50,000 light years wide. 50,000 light years. It's huge. It's immense. You know, like, what is that doing there? It's glorifying God. It's waiting for the day that men in all their ingenuity will come over this cool telescope. Wow, look at this awesome thing. Let's shine it right here. Whoa! What was that? What did we just see? Can you believe that's out there? And God says, that's out there. And as soon as you design... A telescope better than the Hubble telescope, and you can look further. Guess what? You're going to see more of these kinds of things. There's even more there. 28 million light years away from us. Something so beautiful as a sombrero galaxy. What did David mean when he made the statement, the heavens declare the glory of God? What does the glory of God look like? How big, how immense is your God? This is the same God that says, I hold the universe in the palm of my hand. That's what it's like to me. But imagine we go a little bit further into space, another 3 million light years. So now we're 31 million light years away. And what what do we run into? This right here. The Whirlpool Galaxy. It's called a grand design spiral galaxy. It's hundreds of billions of stars. That little light there to the right, that's another galaxy. It's so far away from it, though, it has no danger of being pulled in. It's just when you're looking from this distance, it looks that way. You know, all those little pink things that are in there, those are stars that are being created. In our universe right now, one star per second is being created. Astronomers love this. It's, it's, it looks directly at the Hubble telescope, so you can look straight at it, and uh, they absolutely love it. It's an immense, immense galaxy. You know, we've only looked at just a few of the galaxies. But think back to the picture we looked at originally, where you could look all across the night sky, and everywhere you looked, there are galaxies. A little finger, there are literally hundreds of galaxies. There are Billions and billions of galaxies all throughout space. What is our God really like? Who is He? Surely we have an amazing, amazing God. He is indescribable. He's remarkable. You know, you ask the question, how would we all respond to this today? You know, today we've simply tried to focus on something that David said that thousands of years ago. The heavens declare the glory of God. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Every day, every night, people go out into the night sky and they look and they see the glory of God. We're simply reviewing that God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature can be clearly seen from what He has made. You could know today something about the eternal nature of God. But how would you and I respond to that? How would we leave here today having made a response to this great, indescribable quality of God. You know, the Bible tells us how we would do it. It says here in Psalms 36, verse 5, Your love, O Lord, reaches to the heavens, your faithfulness to the skies. How priceless is your unfailing love. Both high and low among men find refuge in the shadow of your wings. Your love, O Lord, reaches to the heavens. Well, which heavens? 
the sombrero galaxy happens? Yeah. 28 million light years times, you know, 5.88 trillion? Yeah, that, that far. Well, does it reach, you know, all the way, you know, to the Whirlpool galaxy? Yeah, it reaches that far too. That's the size of the love of God. Now, what should a man do? Or what should a woman do with that knowledge? God loves people far beyond our ability to comprehend. Why did that happen? Why did the creator of the world, the one who put all those stars in the heavens, why did he do that? Why did he become a man? Why did he come to the earth? Why did he lay his life down for you? Why did he take your sins away? Why, why, why when you sin and stumble, does he still love you and does he still take all of the sin upon himself as you look at the blood in that picture? It's kind of a gory picture. Why would the Lord do that? Why would he die? Why would he shed his blood? It's an expression of his great love for you. He loves you. He has a great affection for you. He washes your sins away. He longs for you to come to him. Longs for you to, 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 to embrace you. You know, over the next few weeks, I hope that you'll challenge yourself. I'm going to love God back. Wouldn't that be a sensible thing for us to do? I'm going to love him back. If God, who's so amazing and so spectacular, loves me like this, I'm going to love him back. You know, I have to show you one other uh, star system. It's the, it's the uh, nebulae of the Whirlpool Galaxy, and that's what it looks like. Isn't that kind of an amazing sight? You know, you can make of that what you want, but it looks a lot like a cross to me. I think God and his sort of his sense of humor and... It's like, well, I'll just put a, a cross on the night sky. Maybe you'll know that I love you. Maybe you'll remember that I died for you. Even nature cries out about the greatness of God. But how should we respond to him? Well, we should know and be amazed by his love. We should choose to love him back. But listen to what it says here in Isaiah 40. And I hope that each one of us will challenge ourselves today to honor God in our hearts. Isaiah chapter 48, verse 12 says this. Listen to me, O Jacob. Israel, whom I have called, I am He. I am the first and the last. My own hand laid the foundations of the earth. And my right hand spread out the heavens. He's saying, listen to me. Listen to me, Denver Church of Christ. Listen to me, Northwest Region. Listen to me, individual Christian. You whom I've called, put your own name there. I am He. I'm the first and the last. My own hand laid the foundation of the earth. My right hand. Imagine the strength of his right hand spread out the heavens. When I summon them, they all stand up together. He's just saying, I can take my right hand and throw the heavens. They'll all stand up as I tell them to. Come together, all of you, and listen. Which of the idols has foretold these things with his spirit? So God would say, which of all the things today that you trust in can do what I've done? You who trust in your material attainment in life, your career, your job, your relationships, your strength, your entertainment, all the things that people pour their lives into. He's saying of all of those things, those idols that sometimes we, we, we put before God, and, and those are good things if we have them in the right perspective. But at times, they're not in the right perspective. And our hearts are not given to God the way that, that He needs to. He says, which of the idols has foretold these things? This is what the Lord says, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, I am the Lord your God who teaches you what is best for you. Praise God for that. Amen. Who directs you in the way you should go. If only you had paid attention to my commands, your peace would have been like a river. Your righteousness like the waves of the sea. Your descendants would have been like the sand. Your children like its numberless grains. He's speaking to the nation of Israel. But that same lesson applies to Christians of today. If only you had paid attention to my commands. I want you for a minute to think in your heart. How much do we pay attention to God's commands? Think about last week. How much did I devote myself to my Bible, to reading God's commandments? Do I memorize them? Do I tremble at the sound of them? You know, when the Bible says every Christian is supposed to be a committed, sold out disciple. He says, you know, you're supposed to be, you know, lay your life down daily. Do I tremble at those things? Do I tremble about his teachings about righteousness? 
while fleeing from things of this world? Do I tremble when he says, love your neighbors, honor me, follow me, listen to me. I am the Lord your God who teaches you what is best for you. Denver Church, Northwest Region, I would call out to you on this day, soften your hearts. Stop living numb lives. Let's not be numb. Let, let, let's not allow the greatness of God to, to, to blaze past us. Let's instead say that my number one love in life is the Lord. My number one commitment is seeking God's will in my life. I'll seek Him out with all of my heart. Honor God. That's what it would say. And finally, listen to what he says in Isaiah chapter 55, verse 6. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the evil man his thoughts. Let him turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on him. And to our God, for he will freely pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. And I think we can say amen to that, right? Neither are your ways my ways. When we look at the creation, when we look at God's immense, unbelievable power, we can say confidently, neither are your ways my ways. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. He's saying my insights, my knowledge, my thoughts, my will for your life, my direction, my thinking on what's right and wrong, my thinking on what should happen, my ways are higher than your ways, higher than the heavens, are higher than the earth. That great massive expanse that we just looked at, he says, my ways are much higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it blood and bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater. So is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. God is saying today, I have sent you my word. I have called to you from heaven. I have allowed the speaker of the day, which would be me, to call out using my word. I have cried from heaven. And I've told you, seek me while I may be found. Call on me while I am near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the evil man his thoughts. Turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on him. For God, he will freely pardon. God freely pardons his people when they call on him. He loves them immensely. He dies for them. But he tells them, my ways are higher than your ways. Turn to me. My word does not come back void. It will accomplish what I desire. And so today the challenge is seek the Lord. Seek Him with all your heart. Know God today. Know how much God loves you. What does it mean for God to say, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so is my love for you. God loves you unbelievable. That's so incredible. He knows your, your weakness, your sin, your thoughts, all your struggles. He loves you anyway. Love Him back. Appreciate that. Know that that's what's guiding your life. Honor Him. And finally, seek Him. His ways are higher than ours. You know, today we, we started a new installment. God is. What is God? God is indescribable. It's impossible to adequately quantify what God really is. He's too big. He's too immense. He's too magnificent. But He has made Himself known to us. These next few weeks, we'll discover God and we'll learn what He is, what God is. But today, focus on God is indescribable. Amen.